We're going to finish up our series today on victory over darkness. And this last thing we're going to talk about today is something that's so relevant even for all of us right now today. And that's distractions. How many know we got a lot of distractions in the world today? I mean, I mean a lot of them. And what, 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 are, what are some of the major distractions we have? TV. It used to be, but now it's probably our mobile phones. Social networking. Play gaming. Just distract us from being close to God or spending time with God. Sometimes it, you, you, the things can distract us with family. Something happens and different things be, begin to fall apart. So we want to talk with this morning. Don't become distracted. Stick to what God has called you to do. See, distraction is the process of diverting the attention of an individual or a group from a desired area of focus and thereby blocking and diminishing the reception of the desired information. Let me read that to you again. D distractions is the process of diverting attentions to an individual of, of an individual or group from a desired area of focus and thereby blocking and diminishing the reception of the desired information. In other words, distraction, uh, distractions can be this. It's, call, it's caused by the lack of our ability to pay attention or our lack of interest in the object. Those are the two reasons we have a lot of times for the idea of being distracted. So we need to learn how to stay the course. And I want you to, we're going to go into 1 Samuel chapter 17. And it's a story that's familiar with a lot of people within the church. But I want to talk about David and his, his battle with Goliath a little bit. But I also want to talk about how David, he was sent by his father to do one thing. But when he got there, God had another plan for his life. And how he had to go through some things because uh, to stick to the, what God, God had placed in his heart. Now listen. Let's start at 1719. David's brother, brothers and were with Saul and the, and the Israelite army in the Valley of Elam. He said, fighting against the Philistines. So David left the sheep with another shepherd and set out early the next morning. Uh, his, uh, his Jesse had given gifts to take to them. So he, uh, the next morning, as Jesse had directed him, he arrived at the camp just as the, the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield. Now, listen to this. What with shouts of battle cries, soon the Israelites and the Philistines forces stood face, facing each other, army against army. David left the things with the keeper of the supplies and hurried out hurried out to the ranks to get to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine giant, the champion of Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks. Then David heard him shout his usual taunts at the armies of Israel. Let's just pray right now. Father, would you help us right now to be open? Father, not be distracted even this morning that we could hear the word. And Father, allow the word to penetrate our hearts. Father, we ask it right now in Jesus' name. Amen. So David asked what would happen. In verse 24, you see, he says, The man who kills this Philistine, his, he will give his daughter in marriage, and his whole family will be exempted from taxes. And David asked another soldier nearby what will happen, and they told him the same thing. So David had a mission. All of a sudden, he went there to deliver goods for his, for, his, his dad, for, him, for his dad to his brothers. Now, all of a sudden, he sees this giant, giant of a Philistine. And as soon as the Bible tells us that when the Philistine giants come out from the ranks, that the people were afraid. They, the, the army was frightened, and many of them ran off. But David stood there and said, who? Now, look what he says. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? But you see, but I want you to see something first. What? What you, what you, what's your perspective? What's your perspective when you look at things? When David, when the armies of Israel saw this Goliath, they were afraid. David had a totally different perspective. He didn't see it through the lens of, of man. I think David had this, uh, this calling upon his life. We know he was a calling upon his life. But he was looking and saying, man, all, you, all the armies here, you're not, you're not upset that they're defiling God's army? 
And it bugged him. And all of a sudden, he had something well up within him that he wanted to do something about what was going on. He had a different perspective than everybody else did. I mean, he didn't run and hide. As a matter of fact, most, most of us in our, in our lives, most of all, all we ever see is the giants. We don't ever see God in the midst of it. First thing we say, oh, God, this is a mess. What, what happened? And we don't call on God. We don't ask God. We feel we be, we're like the Israelites. Instead of standing there and being victorious and letting God help us, we run away. And David's just this young boy standing there and saying, who is that uncircumcised Philistine? He didn't back down. So what, what perspective means a lot, doesn't it? It, and you gain a deeper spiritual perspective as you grow and you know God in a greater way. Now, listen to this. Uh, he, uh, don't, he said, to, uh, as he's delivering the, the, the stuff, he's going out to there and he's talking to the uh, men about what God, what uh, uh, Sam, uh, Samuel, uh, Saul would do for him if, if he won. But he wasn't, I don't think he's interested in the treasure as much as he's concerned about how Goliath was defying him. Is look at verse, the next part is don't criticize, don't let someone, criticize, don't let someone else faith. Don't criticize someone else's faith. I'll get it right. If you're going to put others' faith down, you better have bigger faith than theirs. So listen to this. And so this is something. It says, and these men gave David the same reply. They said, yes, that is the reward that they, for the person who kills him. But when David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard of David talking to the men, he was angry. He got angry. What are you doing around here? Uh, around here anyway. I, I demand you. He demanded. What about those few sheep you were supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride, your deceit. You're just here to see the battle. And David, David was now being criticized because he's saying, who's this uncircumcised Philistine? He's wanting to stand up for the army of God. And here's these people, here's his brother criticizing him in the midst of it. Anybody ever been trying to do something and somebody's criticizing you the whole time while you're trying to do it? Yeah. And they just won't let up, won't let up. And this is what was going on with David. His brother began to talk about, so David's brother became angry and he began to criticize him. Listen to this. He criticized his integrity. He did. You just came out here. You're not, you just, you need to get back home and take care of the sheep. His dad had sent him there. David didn't go on his own. But he was sent there. He had a mission. So the second thing he said, he questioned his, him about his responsibility. What about the sheep? You should be watching sheep. You shouldn't be here. You're not old enough to be a fighting man. He questioned his, him about his responsibility. He accused him of being prideful. And he questions his motives. I mean, that's everything. When his brother questioned him, that's what he did. But what I want you to see is this, is that Keep your focus. Keep your focus. David kept his focus. David didn't let what his brothers say to him deter him from doing what God placed in his heart to do at this point in time. Look at this. He says, he says this in verse 29 through 30. What have I done? David said to his brother. What have I done? David replied. I was only asking questions. He walked over to some of the other men I like that he just, he just walked away from his brother. How many of us, it's, when somebody's criticizing your faith, the best thing you can do is walk away? Yeah. Because you know what? It's not going to do any good to try to, try to, to defend it. Because they're, 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 they're going to do what they want to do. So the best thing you can do is just walk away from it. Don't stand there and try to argue the matter. Because you know what? Most likely they have, they're, 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 their faith is not that deep all, at all. I love, I love being, meeting people that think they're very spiritual and deep of faith. And then you get to know them and, they get, and they're shallow. But they, they want everybody to know how spiritual they are. Anybody ever met anybody like that? Or is that just me? But there's people like that. And David, David said here, as his brother's criticizing, David just said, there's no cause. One translation, there's no cause for these accusations. You have no right to say this about my, me and my faith and what I'm, I'm doing. And so he just turned away from him. So in this, 
We need to learn how to walk away sometimes. When people start saying something about your, your faith or what, God, what God's called you to do, if you know it's God and he's put it in your heart, sometimes you just got to walk away. Amen? You got to walk away. Now, don't let others criticize you for your faith in God and what he has placed in your hands. Next, don't let others disqualify you. Don't let others disqualify you. The question the, uh, here in verse uh, 31, David's question was reported to King Saul, and the king sent for him. Don't worry about the Philistine, David told Saul. This is, I will go and fight him. I mean, that stirred David, didn't it? He had a calling on his life. He was sticking to what God had called him to do. He wasn't running from the Philistine. David, probably just in his early, maybe late teens, says, I'll go fight this guy. I mean, nobody else has stepped up. And David says, I will go and fight him. Then, listen to what the king says to him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. He's probably looking, Saul was a big guy. He's probably looking down at David and said, that's totally ridiculous. You can't beat that guy. He said, he goes on to say, in this verse, he says, listen, David, he's, he, you're a young man. You're a young boy. This guy's been a warrior since his youth. I mean, he's, you have no chance against him. And David's response was, he says, as Saul says that, there's no way you can fight him, the Philistine, and possibly win. You're only a boy and he's been a fighting man for his youth, for 33. 34, it says, but David persisted. I have been, I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or a bear came and to steal a lamb or a, one of the, from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If an animal turns on me, listen to this, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I mean, this is, this is a young man, right? I have, I have done this both with the lion and the bear, and I'll, I will do this to this pagan Philistine too. For he had defiled the armies of the living God. David was, more, he was, more, he was concerned about the things of God, right. that God was being defiled. And he says, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the, of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Man, he, didn't, he did not get distracted. He didn't allow somebody to, to say, you can't do this, David. He, he pushed on. He didn't do that. the criticism of his brother turn him back. He pushed on. He kept going. He had the faith not to give up. And even when Saul, here the king, says, David, there's no way. You're just too small. You're just a child. And you're just a boy. And this man's been a fighting man. David didn't let any of that get into his spirit. He's standing there and says, I can do this thing. With God, how many, the word of God says, with God, all things are possible. Amen. Amen. He says, I'm not giving up. And so, finally, Saul consented, it says. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. I wonder if he really meant that, Saul said. I think Saul said, oh, go ahead, but I'll be with you. You're not going to be back. I'm never going to see you again. Because this Philistine's going to eat you for lunch. But David, now, I don't know about you. We need to, when you, you're walking in faith, we need to learn how to walk in the gifts and the anointing God has on our life. For your life. Amen? Now listen, to Samuel goes on. He says, Saul, then Saul Gave David his armor. I mean, he says he's a boy. Saul's a big man. You ever seen a, you ever seen the poster of a of a, of a a child that's got his dad's pants on and shoes and everything? I mean, I'm I, I'm thinking this is probably what David looked like standing before Saul. I mean, they, they put his armor. It says he put his armor, a bronze helmet on his and a coat of mail, David put it on, strapped on the sword. I could see, I reminded my little kid as a kid, just dressed up, toppling over, falling over. But he says, he said, David put it on with a sword over it and took a step or two to see what it was like. 
For he had never worn such things before. He says, I can't go in these. I can't do that. I can't go in this, he protested to Sam, uh, uh, Sam, Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them, all, them off again. He picked up his five smooth stones from the stream, and he put them into the shepherd's bag. Then, armed only with his shepherd's staff and a sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Now think about this. There's so many times I've seen this happen. Saul was trying to give David his armor. How many of you can't give somebody else your anointing? There's, there's nowhere in the Bible does it talk about a trans, does it say a transference of anointing? There, there's, a, I know some people saying, what about Elijah and Elisha? That, that, that story, you got to read into that story because it was actually, he was asking for a birthright as an elder son that it was due him because of, he, he left everything to follow Elijah. And that, so you can study that and look at that. It has nothing to do with, I'm, he was giving him his anointing. He said, he said, as a matter of fact, Elijah said, that's not mine to give. But see, there, there, God has an anointing for each and every one of us. Each one of us, according to James, has an anointing within us. You have the Spirit of God living in you. And there's giftings that God has put in your life that you need to walk in and not try to walk in somebody else's anointing. Try to be somebody else. I've seen a lot of schizophrenic Christians trying to be somebody else. I mean, there, uh, uh, somebody comes into the church and all of a sudden there's a, so somebody's just like, oh man, they're so spiritual. And they, next time the pastor gets a pulpit, he's acting like one of them. Anybody ever know, you ever seen that happen? And they don't know who they are spiritually. And I, I want to encourage you this morning. You have to walk in what the gifting God called you. That's the reason David said, I can't go in Saul's armor. I can't make it in Saul's armor. I'll die in this armor if I try it. Remember the guys in, in the book of Acts with Paul? The seven sons of Sceva? What happened to them when they tried to cast out demons? They got beat up. <laughs> Badly. They were, they, 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 I mean, I love that, that scripture says, it says, Paul we know, Jesus we know, but who are you? They had no power. They, they were trying to do something that they didn't have. You can't operate in somebody else's anointing. God wants you to walk, flow in the anointing he has for you and flow in the gifts that he has put in you. Amen? Amen. He says, I can't do this. See, then we come to the place where you find, find the reward. This is the blessing. This is, he said here, so David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. David used it to kill and to cut off his head. Now think about this. When the Philistines saw this, saw that their champion was dead, they turned and ran. That's the reward. When, when we will not be deterred and not be distracted and not allowed to stretch we can there's reward there's blessings amen but if we if we keep allowing ourselves to be distracted by the things of the world around us by by sometimes the, our the the phone in our pocket or different things i mean i have to work at that a lot of times my wife we were we were at a, a thing uh, a wedding actually the conyers uh, uh vow renewal last night i had my phone on the table she says can you put that away I wasn't talking. I wasn't looking at it. She said, can you put that away? I said, it's not bothering. She said, just put it away. It's between us. So I, so I took it out of my pocket and put it away. You know, because that, that, it was distracting her. Because she thought I was going to pick it up any time and check something. So the best thing you can do when you, when you go to a restaurant with your, your spouse, don't, don't, take your, don't take your cell phone in. Don't sit there and talk to her. Trying to, she's talking to you and you're trying to. Her. I mean, we have gotten so distracted in our society. We've gotten so distracted in the church. 
To the point where there's people, I, I walk around and I see some of the, what goes on. I see kids playing on their, their phones and different things and stuff. Why, why right here in service? I know someone will say, well, I hear it and I can think better. <laughs> I don't necessarily believe that. Yeah. But David won the victory here. So when the, uh, they, they turn around, and the, if you read the continuous story, they, they ran, and the Philistines uh, ran, and Israelites chased after them all the way back to Gath. And they won a great victory that day because one young man decided he wasn't going to be distracted. He wasn't going to be distracted. And he knew God was with him. And I want to encourage you to don't become distracted. Remember what I said the distraction is? It's the process of diverting the attention of an individual or a group from a desired area of focus and thereby blocking the, or diminishing the reception of the desired information. See, if we don't stay focused as a church, we'll, we'll miss out. We'll miss out on what God wants to do. We won't be effective in reaching the city. We won't be effective in doing the things that God has called us to do. Don't allow the world to distract you from what God has asked you of you. Don't allow the world to take you and, re and just bring you out spiritually when, there's, when God wants to renew you. So with that in mind, let me ask you a qu few questions. What has distracted you from the things of God? What's distracting you right now in your life from the things of God? I mean, all of us at times have become distracted, don't we? What's distracted you from becoming intimate with God? Just think about it. It could be, it could be a hobby. It could be, it could be a habit. It could be a lot of different things. Don't say it's your wife or your spouse. But what is it? What is it that is distracting you from God? From really selling out and being the man or woman of God that God wants you to be? We need to answer that question. The se third, second question we need to answer is this. What do you need to do to keep from getting distracted? What do you need to do to, to need to do to get, keep from getting distracted. What do you need to do? Do you need to make, you need to make some decisions? Maybe to turn some things off? Limit yourself to certain things? Set some boundaries up in your life? That you're not going to allow these things any, any longer to divert your attention away from God? What do you need to do to keep from getting distracted? The first question was, what has distracted you from things, the things of God? Second was, what do you need to do to keep from getting distracted? And thirdly, are you willing to let go of the thing, a thing or things that is distracting you? See, if, it's, if something's coming between me and God, I, I need to get, get rid of it. Not, not necessarily throw it out, but I need, to get, I need to put it in place where it needs to be. So my question that, question, that last question, are you willing to let go of the thing that is distracting you? It could be, it could be, a, it could be a relationship that you're hoping will work out and God's not even in it, but you're trying to force it to happen. And God's saying, if you just let go, I've got something better for you. It could be, it could be a, a job situation that you're, you're trying so hard to make it happen. To the point where you don't have time. You don't have time for a family. You don't have time for, your, for yourself to even get into the word of God. You don't have time to pray. You just, I mean, you're just trying to push your way through the best you can. It could be a hobby that you may have. That you can't, you can't, you almost neglect your family because of your hobby. Because you want to be, you want to be able to go and do what you want to do. There's a lot of things that distract us at times, isn't there? So are we willing to let go of the thing that distracts us? I know that's, that's, not, a, that's not easy to do. How many know, I told somebody this other day, habits are easy to make, but they're hard to break. 
Isn't it true? They're easy to make, but they're hard to break. But see, God wants us to not be dis- distracted and not to, he wants to break some of the old habits off of us. That we can get back into the word. We can get back into prayer and get back where we need to be as, as believers. I'm not saying we're backslidden, but I am saying there's times we allow ourselves to get distracted. Politics, everything that's going on in the world right now, gas prices, I mean, food going up, every, everything's happened. And all of a sudden we worry, worry, worry. And what does the word of God say? He says, we're not to worry. He says, what does worry add to your life? This worry, worrying is a distraction. So what are, we, what are we doing? Are you resting in God's peace? Like David knew who he was. David, David was so confident that he says, I don't care what the, 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 the criticism or anything that's come against me. I'm not giving up. I'm going through. I'm going, to, I'm going to finish the job. I want us to have that same determination that we've set in our heart and our mind. I'm not giving up. I'm not going to allow the world to distract me, but I know God has something for me to do. And I'm going to finish it. You know, I, I heard somebody say one time, it's not how, how good you start, it's how well you finish. That's, how many of people will remember how you finish better than they did you, how you started? Yes. And see, I don't want to become so distracted that I miss out on finishing well. Amen? I'm going to ask the worship team to come. But church, we've got to t- come to a place just like David, just like David here. He just, he made up his mind. He stayed the course. And I know when the Bible says in the last days, there will be people that will fall away. But it, there, I know there's also going to be people, new people coming into the kingdom. I think one of the biggest, uh, Dave Howden said this many years ago to me. He said, the biggest weapon that Satan uses against the church today is distraction. He said, because most Christians, he's not going to get them out to go out and commit adultery. He's not going to be able to get them to go rob a bank or something or kill someone. But if he can get them distracted, he can defeat them. Isn't it true? So think about that. Stay the course. Stay the course. What's your perspective? Get God's perspective in it. Don't, don't just look at the situation and say, oh my God, look at the giant. Say, God, you can help me slay that giant. You can help me defeat that giant. Don't criticize someone else's faith in God. If somebody's young, and I mean, we I've had young kids come and say, I'm going to do this. And I say, okay, do it. I don't want, I don't want to diminish their faith and their, and their desire. But church, I want us to be single-minded just upon God. See, if we're going to, if we're going to finish well and we don't want, don't want to be distracted, we have to make sure that our, our, not only our hearts, but our eyes are fixed on Jesus. That's how we keep from being distracted. Keep our heart and our eyes turned toward Jesus.